Good afternoon and welcome everybody. It's Dorothy Polarski from Midday Moms. Um, as you're signing on and as you're joining us, I would ask if you could in the chat box, if you were to say hello. I, uh, I saw just a few minutes ago that Lynette from Hawaii was joining us. So oh, Lynette, lovely. <laughs> Lynette, if you want to say hello, I'd love to hear from you. Um, Lynette, I would have come to you to present. <laughs> <laughs> If you ever need a speaker in Hawaii, That's actually, right. I don't know if I ever told you, Teresa, but I did deliver the How to Start a Mother's Group workshop. Oh, lovely. Archdiocese of uh, Honolulu. Good for you. Good yeah, for you. A number of years ago. Anyway, so I uh, would like to welcome each and every one of you and thank you for joining us today for Midday Moms. Um, some of you have met me before. It's Dorothy Polarski. We work in partnership with the Archdiocese of uh, Toronto. And we're on a mission to revive the vocation of motherhood. And we do so primarily by helping parishes start Catholic moms groups. Um, we have a very special guest today, um, Teresa Harnett. Teresa uh, Hartnett, I always forget that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, I get a lot of different things. <laughs> I always think of your heart that I'm like, okay, don't forget. <laughs> she's, she's a net for catching hearts. That's the way I I, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, Teresa, do you wanna just maybe say hello to everybody before I formally introduce you? Say hello. Yes, I'm, I'm very happy to be here today. Dorothy and I have been, working for a long time, it seems now, almost two years trying to bring the Catholic Moms Group uh, into the Hamilton Diocese, but we've touched base kind of over the years on different things, and so uh, I'm really happy to be here working uh, with her today because I know she does so much work for motherhood, and I uh, left a job that I love to take on Director of Family Ministry because I believe in the family and motherhood and fatherhood. Uh, so I'm happy to be here today with this uh, great work. Yeah, so th thank you very much for joining us. I do want to say hello to, um, you know, to Janice. Janice, I know that you're from Milton and St. Benedict. I'm hoping we're going to find a mother's group leader there. Hi, Martine. It's great to, to see you. I know, Martine, you're from Mississauga. Uh, please do say hello. Uh, it's uh, always wonderful to hear from you. It's always wonderful to know where you are, not where you are, but where you're from. So please do uh, drop in and say hello. Again, I mentioned that um, our ministry, if you haven't visited our website, I would ask you that you visit our website. And it's three words, Catholic momsgroup.com and uh, we're hoping that somebody here will be motivated and inspired to start a Catholic moms group. In just a few minutes I'm going to show you our um, ministry video. It's just a very short video and shortly after that um, we'll turn to Teresa and we'll hear her talk. So let me just share our short video, if I could, here, come Holy Spirit. Oh my goodness, that's not what I'm wanting to show you. Stop share. Okay, come Holy Spirit, there we go. Back to the Zoom meeting, come Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to try sharing again. You're all being very, very patient with me. So I really appreciate your patience. I'm having trouble. Maybe God doesn't want me to show that. Oh, there it is. <laughs> there you go. Oh, there I go. <laughs> Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, I'm not as slick as uh, you know some of you, but here we are. So we're on a mission to revive the vocation of motherhood, hoping to bring all mothers closer to our blessed mother. And um, yes, we help parishes start three types of groups, uh, mothers groups that are just strictly for moms and they're usually our evening groups. We also help parishes start moms and tots groups. And we also help parishes start virtual groups. 
And so here's our very short video. Again, you see it's just three minutes long, so I hope you enjoy it. Mothers, by our very nature, we are nurturing, loving caregivers. We are social beings made for friendship and community. We are also spiritual by nature, made by a loving God to know him and love him and to pass this love of our Catholic faith on to our children. But right now, many mothers feel overextended, distracted, and exhausted. Though as Catholics, we have the community of our church, many mothers attending Mass could not name the mom sitting next to them in the pew they share. Community and support among Catholic mothers is desperately needed in this hectic and chaotic culture your parish needs you to bring these moms together. Hi, my name is Dorothy Polarski. I'm the founder of Catholic Moms Group. We at Catholic Moms Group are on a mission to revive the vocation of motherhood. We exist to bring together like-minded, faith-filled mothers who crave community and are focused on spiritual growth, Catholic teaching, and fellowship. Can you imagine a thriving, engaged mother's group at your parish? A group of moms in love with their Catholic faith, ready to serve other mothers no matter what stage of motherhood they're at. Can you imagine what a difference that would make at your parish? Starting a mother's group, it's not rocket science, but working with a team who's done it before and who's done it dozens and dozens of times sure does help. The Catholic Moms Group membership site is an online community that offers training, resources, and dozens of tools for parishes to help them start a mother's group quickly and efficiently. We're here to provide you with a clear path to launching a Catholic Moms Group at your parish. All of our materials are 100% Catholic. We have clearly laid out meetup plans for both mom's groups and toddler groups. We are obedient to the magisterium of the Catholic Church. We have created dozens of tools that are going to save you time and energy. And besides that, we love our Blessed Mother. We constantly turn to her for her intercession. You can make a huge impact in your parish, so join us. We are revolutionizing the way parishes start mother's groups by providing parishes with a Catholic mother's group starter kit and by nourishing and training a community of Catholic mother's group leaders across the world. It's time to start a mother's group at your parish. Join us today. She says aloha to us, so Lynette, Lynette is here. Um, so yes, we're uh, on a mission to revive the vocation of motherhood, and we're here to help a parish start that. I've got some very, very exciting news. We have started a mother's group in the North Pole, Alaska. <laughs> and uh, this week, we're starting a mother's group um, actually in the Diocese of Peterborough. Uh, remember, if you've never, you know, had a mother's group before, we have 12 training videos as a part of our membership website that will teach you every single step of the way. So don't be afraid, uh, join us, and please know that you won't be alone. I'd like to formally introduce Teresa Harnett. Hartnett, I'm gonna just... <laughs> I always say God keeps me humble by making me make all these, because I make these silly mistakes, so forgive me. So um, Teresa is in her 18th year as Director of Family Ministry for the Diocese of Hamilton. She has her Master's in Religious Education from St. Augustine Seminary, University of Toronto, a degree in Kinesiology from McMaster University, a Bachelor of Education from Brock, 
and is certified in a number of family counseling, marriage and relationship programs. She has been the executive director of Birthright Pregnancy Service in Hamilton for 32 years and in 2004 implemented and now oversees Project Rachel in the Hamilton of Diocese. She is passionate about helping individuals, couples and families to grow strong, healthy and happy in both how they live and their faith. Teresa undertakes numerous speaking engagements across Ontario and Canada each year and she teaches for both St. Peter's Seminary and the Halton Catholic School Board staff religion courses. Um, we are honored to have Teresa here. Um, I love her to pieces. Uh, we've been working together for the past two years trying to create some of these moments to minister to moms in the Hamilton of Diocese. Uh, we've also worked on another project together years and years ago for mom. <laughs> so uh, it's just such a privilege to have her here. Teresa, not only, you're, not only are you a, a director, not only are you a mother, but you're a grandmother. Can you tell us how many kids you have? And can you tell us how many- I can, I have four children, two boys and two girls. Uh, and uh, my two boys are both married and have children, one four and one, have, one has two. I have a daughter who's married and we're hoping soon we'll hear some news there. So hopefully some more babies. You're going to see my six grandchildren. They're on the first slide uh, mm -hmm. I have. So uh, enjoying it very much. We've been, of course, COVID has, my youngest granddaughter was born last August amongst COVID. So we have uh, seen them on a lot of outdoor visits, but not so many indoor visits. So we're glad that things are starting to open up again and uh, we'll be able to have more time as a whole family instead of part families. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, you've got a lot of experience, I'm sure, um, disciplining not only your own children, but I'm sure your, your grandchildren as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, discipline as easy as one, two, three, and then once you tell us about it, the floor is yours. So thank you. Well, I'll tell you many, many years ago when I first started the diocese and my children were still relatively young, um, I went to a conference and heard this speaker give a one hour talk, a little more than I'm giving today. Uh, and I thought this makes complete and total sense. And he gave all the data and the research. So you're gonna have to trust uh, that it, it, it is there. Uh, and it is really simply that we talk too much to our kids. And in talking to our kids, we do a disservice to them and ourselves. And so his program is designed for this non-talking, this one, two, three. They learn what your expectations are. They don't get rewarded for bad behavior. Uh, you'll see all this. I'm going to try to go through it quickly. So uh, one, two, three discipline really is that as simple as one, two, three then we give a punishment. Uh, and that uh, punishment is sometimes just a timeout. Uh, but it, uh, so it works. Both of my daughter-in-laws and my sons, uh, I told them about the program before they had kids, they read it. And my daughter-in-law says, I can't believe how well it works. When you put implement it, it works. So oh, that's, that's uh, fantastic. So just before you get started, I want to just say a couple of more hellos. Hello, Hannah from Nebraska. Great to see you here. Uh, Mary Catherine, wonderful that you're here. Claude, very happy that you're here. Um, uh, Andrea, nice to see you here. Uh, Muggs, Martha, so welcome all of you. Um, just a big, big warm welcome. And I would ask then that you tell us all about it. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen now if that's okay. Sure. Uh -huh. And we'll get started as soon as my thing behaves itself. So there's my little grandchildren. I put them into the discipline easy as one, two, three. Uh, and sometimes we say impossible. But before we start, I want to start with a quote. Uh, I will start and end with a quote, actually, from Pope Francis, uh, because I think uh, this is a Morris Leticia family year. Uh, and the Morris Leticia uh, is all about family, the challenges, and all the necessities of it, if you will, in the world. And so 
uh, for moms who are trying to engage on this level of parenting being one of their main stays of life, it's very important uh, that we understand the church is behind you, God is behind you, uh, lots of people are behind you. So Pope Francis said this recently uh, in a talk that he gave, a life without challenges doesn't exist. And that is one of the reasons a child needs a mother. Mothers fulfill a vital role by helping children look realistically at life's problems without getting lost, without it getting lost on them. Uh, and so Pope Francis, uh, again, is bringing that challenge to motherhood that that we are the foundation that we set for our children. And in setting a foundation, part of that foundation becomes discipline. So I'm just gonna quickly go through the program because I've got lots to share with you. Please feel free to put a, a question about a particular slide uh, in the chat and Dorothy will, uh, will cut in and remind me that there's one there because I'm not wearing my glasses and it's hard to read the chat room without my glasses. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and get into it. So the program is a program by Thomas uh, W. Valen. He's a PhD, as you see there. Uh, and it's a great book. I've got a, a DVD series on it as well. And the material really is coming straight from his program. So it's not me making it up. Uh, if somebody thinks it sounds really good, uh, you can easily access it uh, online. So we know that Parenting is a big responsibility, as we just talked about with the Pope. Uh, it's laughter, it's discipline, it's fun. Uh, this one's a nice one. There's moments of, as you see, their pain. Uh, I remember years and years ago going to a conference and the speaker stood up and said, I had two children um, and I was just expecting my third. And um, so I'm sorry you're going to hear my granddaughter for a moment in the background. She's here online schooling. So <laughs> I didn't think she would talk, but of course, now that I'm online, she is. In any case, um, this teacher said that, uh, sorry, this presenter said that, uh, okay, okay Amory, I'm sorry, really, you have to go fast because grandma's presenting. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, this presenter said, my link, claim to fame is that I have five uh, adolescence at home and all oh, the cloud roared and I'm surviving it. You know, I survived it and everybody clapped and roared. And I had this, you know, one and a half year old and three year old. So I didn't see what this was a big deal about. And, and then I had my four in their teen years. And then I used to say I survived adolescence because those are maybe the more challenging years. So although this, this work, you're going to look at it and think it's mostly about young children it works on any age. It's just the older the age, the more challenging it is to put something into place that hasn't, you know, been uh, necessarily part of what you've been doing. So motherhood, parenthood, you know, requires patience, persistence, time. Uh, and it really requires us to teach skills to our children from the moment they're born. They're not born with the skills. And everyone who sees parents who engage and who do their best with their children will see the difference. So um, it is uh, challenging at times to be a parent, but of course, as the Pope is saying, it's necessary uh, for us as well to uh, engage. So let's get right into it. So it's sort of the three steps, if you will, to controlling uh, behavior. And it, it, it's it's not magical, this one, two, three. <laughs> it sounds like one, two, three, poof. It's not magical, but it's effective. It's effective in managing uh, gently and firmly the behavior of children. They learn the concepts. I don't want to call it Pavlovian conditioning because we know that's done on animals, but in a sense it is. It becomes when you say one, they begin to know they've got to calm themselves. And so you often don't have to get to three once they understand you're going to, you know, go through with it. So, um, it, it puts parents in charge of the, if you will, strategy. Uh, there's no arguing, there's no yelling, there's no spanking. None of that is necessary uh, when people are um, engaging. So uh, very important. And as a general rule with this program, um, when they've studied parents who are using it, who go from not using it to using it, 50% of people will see almost an immediate response when there's already been a good sort of discipline cycle in the home, when the family relationship is strong. Uh, but mostly it's because we call those children cooperators. 50% of children are cooperators. They kind of want to come in line. And so as soon as they know what you want, they do. 
The other 50% are um, children that are a little more, if you will, challenging. Some of you may have them. One of mine was that way. When she was a young child, before she was five, I said to my husband, one of us is not going to survive till her adolescence <laughs> because just everything was a test, if you know. Uh, but anyway, those children are more challenging. But the studying of the program says if you stick to it strongly, if you don't get out of your new role and how you're going to act within seven to 10 days, even the strongest will comes into line. So, you know, these are the things that we want. We want to control obnoxious behavior. We want to encourage good behavior. We want to strengthen uh, your relationship with your child because when there's not yelling and screaming, nobody feels uh, bad about it. So there's two basic kinds of problems with kids, as you can see on the screen there. One is that we want to stop behaviors, and the other is that we want to start behaviors, and you can see the list. So we all understand sometimes we only think about the stop behaviors, but often the the behaviors that become challenging for us to deal with in wanting to have these stop behaviors, we want to stop the whining, etc., is because we're not dealing with the start behaviors well. Uh, and so um, both become a little bit at times of a nightmare. So you think of when your child is interacting with you and you're having an issue that you're always probably looking at one of these. Is this a stop behavior that I'm trying to do or is this a start behavior that I'm trying to uh, have them engage in? And either one uh, can be a challenge. Uh, sometimes the start behaviors, surprisingly enough, can be more of a challenge because uh, there are things that, you, that you, they need to be motivated to do. If they're doing stop behaviors, they're motivated and getting something already. That's why they're doing the behavior uh, and you don't want them to. So uh, it is, again, a, you know, a simple tactic that may not quite seem that way, but it's simple, it's gentle, and it's direct. And so it's a great way to parent. So for start behaviors, those behaviors where you want them to start doing something, you saw the list, um, we have to use, if you will, reward. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more on this later, so I don't want to go into too much detail now that we're short on time. But these are specific things that work for uh, helping kids to actually start uh, doing something. And sometimes as parents, we can be guilty, expecting the busyness of life, uh, of forgetting how well praise works for our children. Most children, even ones that are sometimes very challenging, want to be praised. They don't deliberately do things to get into trouble, uh, but sometimes they've developed habits. So we'll look at those, but those, these that you're looking at here are tactics that will help the child to uh, begin to do something that you're asking them to do. One of the false assumptions that we have, uh, and that causes problems all the time, is um, that kids uh, have hearts of gold, are basically reasonable, they're basically unselfish, uh, you know, that, that, that they come into the world, uh, you know, it's just a little, another smaller version of an adult. And you can see how that does not work for this baby and it does not work for young children. So because they're little adults, uh, we think the reason they're not doing the right thing is that they don't have enough information in their disposal to do the right thing. When our frontal cortex develops, we begin to share uh, things with people we explain. We explain why we're doing something, why they shouldn't do that, and it makes sense, but not so for little ones. And so this false understanding of who they are can cause issues. So um, we think they will and can, if you will, listen to words and to reason. Uh, but what happens when we get into that scenario of talking, of trying to explain and all that thing, it leads to just that, that we're talking, then we move to trying to persuade them, we're trying to give them their good argument, uh, then we argue because they're not doing it, then we get annoyed, and so we can start to yell or our voices get stronger or we get, you know, and then sometimes uh, for some people, we get into what is called the hit syndrome. It's the last straw. Nothing else has worked. So now I'm going to have to use corporal punishment. And corporal punishment isn't really necessary when you use the kind of discipline that we're looking at here. So it's an escalation of emotion within us. We get, uh, we, we get blocked at the wall. There's nothing else to do. And we feel we have to go uh, to that extent. So if we can escalate 
before we get to that stage, before we get mad and simply think, well, that's it, uh, we can uh, help uh, both ourselves and the children. So um, it, it, most often it's not something we want to do. So in a way, uh, when we are using that kind of, uh, of talk, persuade, we get into this uproar, the emotion starts to rise and we feel a little bit out of control. So we really have to think of ourselves as, I hate to say this because my granddaughter is sitting beside me, but her dad uh, is a manager now of a store of PetSmart, but when he started out, he was doing dog training and he said, he saw how well the dogs behaved when they were given a direct message, they're given a reward for it. And so he was going to use the same type of sort of, uh, you know, on his children and it has worked. And so it's interesting uh, because this is sort of what this is saying that if you kind of think of yourself as an animal uh, trainer and not that your kids, well, we are all animals, but not in that sense, but just that animals, you wouldn't think of telling the dog is really hot outside today. So we're going to go for a walk early. Now get on, come on, get your leash on, do the, a whole, no, because you, but you'd say the dog doesn't understand it. So why am I doing any of that? But often we do all of that with children. And so uh, when we choose methods that are largely nonverbal, so we mostly aren't saying anything um, and repeat them, then we get the message across to our children. So we have to be a trainer of animals, has to be patient, has to be gentle, uh, but also persistent. So we need to be the same with our children, gentle, but persistent in saying that they must do what we're asking them to do. We have to end up being the one in charge. So as kids get older, as they move out of those younger years, you have to add more talking and reasoning. Uh, and still, it should only be one explanation and that should be enough. Uh, and oftentimes it is not, we, we say too much. So um, we really need as our children age and it's a gradual movement, we have to move from dictatorship, if you will, to democracy. So when our kids are little, we pretty much dictate their life, what they're eating, when they're going to bed, what they can do, uh, all those types of things. But as our kids get older, gradually in those preteen years into their teen years, we need to start slowly moving into this democracy where we say, okay, uh, it appears that, you know, you're having a hard time getting up in the morning. So what are we going to do about that? Let's set a different bedtime, or perhaps they don't need as much sleep. So you say, listen, uh, it appears that you'd like to have a little bit of time in the evening, but I want you to be able to relax and, you know, sort of decompress. So why don't we see what is your solution? They may say to you, how about if I take a book to bed? How about if I, whatever, listen to music? What if we read together for a half hour? So again, we're moving into democracy, but we're still in control. And that's the important piece. Because even in adolescence, and maybe more so in adolescence, if we don't set the groundwork for the fact that I'm listening, I'm letting you explain, I'm giving you my side, we're working towards a solution. Uh, if we don't stay in control, we can still move into that sort of syndrome of talk, persuade, uh, you know, getting emotional and, and possibly moving uh, forward into that position of, uh, of getting angry enough to even uh, potentially consider hitting. So two mistakes that we make, simple. If you remember nothing else, this is the two to remember. Too much talking, too much emotion. So uh, there's a lot of studies to show that we talk makes kids less cooperative. The more we say, the more they don't do it. So I had one of my sons who was very much like this. So if I told him to go upstairs and clean his room, but I said, listen, uh, we're going to have company on the weekend. They might be putting their coats upstairs. I really want you to clean up your bedroom. Make sure you put all the clothes in the laundry. You make your bed and put your toys away uh, and all of that. Nothing would happen. I learned that early on when I said to him, go to your room and pick up your clothes off the floor. Then after five minutes, I'd yell up, put your toys away. After a five more minutes, whatever the next thing was, everything got done. So simple instruction, straightforward. So uh, that's a, a, an essential piece, direct, short, one thing at a time. Uh, it's not that they're being obstinate. It's often that their mind won't and can't take it all in. Uh, and too much emotion when you're irritated or angry uh, with your child, it's a problem because what do we do when we're angry? Angry adults often yell, scream. Sometimes we belittle. 
We say things that are not even true. Sometimes we nag. And even as it's coming out of our mouth, we think, oh, I shouldn't be saying this. But something about the emotion gets the better part of us. I mean, it's the same for couple relationships, isn't it? So there's another reason. Little kids feel inferior and completely powerless because they are when we're yelling and screaming. Uh, and this lessness, if you will, understanding how out of control they are compared to you, it bothers them very much. And so they feel um, that they don't want to do what you're asking them to do. Uh, they don't want to uh, behave because when they don't, they regain some of the power and capability that you're taking away when you're screaming at them. In some ways, it seems counterintuitive. You think that they would want to behave so you would be happy, but no, they're trying to regain some control. So the, the madder you get, the less likely they are to do something because they're gaining control back. So, uh, you know, children will uh, sort of throw stones into the water for hours because it makes a splash. That makes them feel powerful. Most adults will sew for a couple minutes and want to move on. So little children are trying to find a way to make themselves feel powerful in light of that. So, um, you know, if they can get you to yell or become upset, in some ways they're in the power position because you told them, pick up your toys. They don't. Now you come back. I said to pick up those toys. I want those toys away before we go to bed. They don't. Each time you come in, you're often a little madder, a little firmer, a little more threatening. And so in a sense, they kind of feel like they have the power, even if the reward is temporary for the moment that you come in and get angry, uh, they learn that feeling. And so the bad behavior is repeated. Each time you ask them to put away their clothes or their toys or whatever, they don't. So with discipline, what we really want to be is consistent decisive and calm. We're in charge. We're in control. We don't need to get angry. We know that you're going to do this. So you need to apply uh, during moments of conflict and discipline, the concept of no talking, no emotion rule. I'm going to say as little as I have to, uh, and I'm not going to get emotional. It's critical to how effective uh, you will be. And um, if you don't follow these two rules, uh, and especially more when there's a lot going on, the no talking, no emotion, you'll actually probably make the situation uh, worse. So controlling uh, sort of obnoxious behavior is this one, two, three. We do not need to explain what they're doing. They know if we say it immediately. So you control all of this. You have no talking, no emotion by simply saying one, when they say something rude, when you say, pick up your toys and they look at you, that's one. You wait a minute, that's two. So they know what you've asked them to do. You said, pick up the toys, they clearly know it. You don't need to explain it. You don't need to give the why, you don't need to go on and on about all of that. Uh, but whatever the behavior is, if they're being rude, if they're climbing on furniture when you've told them not to, if they're grabbing things at the store and saying, I want this toy, I want this toy, all of those things, one, two, three is deceptively simple. They know if you follow through that this is what's going to happen. Uh, and so um, you'll see when you try this that it works and you might be surprised. So the magic is not in the counting though, um, but it's in not giving any emotional sort of, if you will, uh, power to them. Uh, and it's also in them knowing that you're go going to behave. So here's an example. A, a four-year-old's having a temper tantrum on the floor at 6 p.m. because you said no to potato chips because you're going to have dinner any second. Have we all been there at, <laughs> at some point? Because that's what happens. Uh, and, you know, uh, banging their head, kicking the cupboards, screaming as though they're being murdered. They want the chips. They need the chips. And a lot of times, eventually we say, we're going to have dinner. You're not going to be able to eat your dinner. You're not, a, that's not a nutritious food. We're into this whole talking thing. And then either we get over angry or we actually give in. Okay. You can have two chips. 
And you just said that if you keep going on long enough, you'll get at least partially what you want. So should you ignore the tantrum? Should you spank him? What should you do to distract him? All those kinds of things. But instead, as soon as they start, when you implement this on all levels, you and you can explain to them that we're going to be doing this from now on, mommy and daddy are only going to view three. And then you're going to be uh, into a, a consequence. So instead, you just hold up your finger, look at them. And as soon as they glance up at you, because they always make sure you're watching, you know what they say about ignoring, just say one. And then doesn't care in full range after a few seconds, you very calmly say two, that's two. Uh, and then probably the same response. Uh, after five seconds, you say calmly three. Okay, take five. So your child now is given the chance to calm down. So now there's no consequence if they, when you say take five, they, they you know, relax. Um, but probably they're not going to. Take five means go. In my son's house, they have a chair. Sometimes the kids go there themselves before they even tell them to go sit in the chair to, to take five and calm yourself. So this is, again, we're asking you to go to the chair because you couldn't get yourself under control. So back here, when I start counting, if you get yourself under control, you won't be in timeout. As they get older, that may be their room. So one minute per age of the child is enough. Uh, we can't have them sitting, you know, sometimes parents sit them in the chair for five minutes, 50 minutes, half an hour. Unfair. One minute per age of the child uh, is enough. And, um, you know, as they get older, you might not want to go to 17 minutes because you're going to look at other disciplinary actions for older children. So if you could be, it could be, a, you know, also a full timeout uh, alternative. If you're not somewhere where you can give them a timeout, then there can be a loss of privilege or a toy for a period of time, an earlier bedtime by 15 minutes, no electronics for two hours. So as your children age, remember the democracy, you can say to them, when you are misbehaving, not listening, being rude, we are going to have to implement some uh, consequence for that behavior. So of course you have the chance to behave. What are the things that you believe would be good consequence? Maybe they won't give you good things. So you'll say, well, here's the things that I'm going to give, but they, you might be surprised. Well, it would be really bad if I, you know, didn't have my uh, games for half an hour or whatever. And so you implement those. Okay. No games for half an hour, but you have to then uh, make sure that you follow through, that you don't let them have the games, that you don't uh, let them have the toy or the book, or that you don't let them go to bed at the same time as you were when you told them it was going to be 15 minutes earlier. So, you know, how do you get them to their room or the timeout chair? When they're little enough, of course, you can carry them there. And don't be afraid uh, to, to block them. Stand in front of the chair, stand in front of their door. I know a lot of parents who have put the barn door so that they can lock the bottom. The top is open. The kid's not, you know, locked in their room uh, per se but the parent can stand outside and the, the child can't get out easily. So uh, there's, there's lots of things you can do, uh, but when they get bigger, say by the time they're 10, um, you know, you, you may have to come into these alternative forms of discipline. Uh, and so, uh, you know, again, all of this happens without negotiating, without yelling, without uh, having an emotional, you simply t count to three and then tell them what the consequences and then follow through. Um, and when they do, if, if getting going to their room is going to be the punishment, um, you know, it doesn't work if you start talking to them when they go to their room. And if they throw a tantrum in the room and decide to mess up their room, um, we're going to get to that in a second, but that has to be secondary. This is the moment they're going to their room for this thing. And that's what you're teaching them on. The room can be a separate, let them, let them make their room go apart and don't clean it up for them. Don't talk to them about it. Don't tell them they can't do that because now we're getting into talking and emotion. And so both of those things uh, matter. The no talking other than the count, 
no talking after trying to get them to rationalize what you're doing, just explain what it's going to be. So uh, here's another example. So, you know, how can this one, two, three help whining? So uh, again, like the potato chips, if a child asks for the Twinkie right before dinner, uh, there's no issue. You say no, and they ask why, okay? They don't get a one for asking, that's okay. Kids ask, kids try. They say, can I have a Twinkie? Your answer is no, that's fine. Um, uh, then, uh, you know, you say, because we're eating dinner soon, uh, all is good. Maybe you give that brief explanation. Uh, they reply, yeah, but I want one or please, please, please. Can't you give me one? And you continue the conversation. I said, no, we're going to have dinner soon. I, again, like the potato chips. So the first explanation, no, because we're going to have dinner soon. Okay. The child saying, please, 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 I want one. And then you're repeating the explanation. Now you moved into a problem because you put them in control. That's when you say to them, that's one. And if they keep up, you move on to that's two. Uh, two no talking, no emotion, remember. And so, uh, you know, a reasonable question you can answer. But if they continue, maybe they say, well, what time's dinner? That's, that's not a problem. They're, they're asking you a legitimate question. So you're not going to say that's two. Uh, but if they are whining, if they keep on about the Twinkies, you're going to say that's two. And if they say more, then you say that's three, take five, which is your signal for timeout. Uh, again, the same thing. So, but if after one, because they're going to be really grumpy, they're throwing themselves on the floor, uh, and all that kind of stuff. But if they say, you know, grumpy, oh, all right, fine. Or you never give me anything. Don't engage in conversation. Don't get emotional yourself. Let them walk away. They handled the situation. They made a comment, but was okay. But if they say, oh, you stupid jerk, then you're going to go right to three. That's three, take five. So you see the difference is important that they understand that when they cross the line, you will engage in the discipline. But when they don't cross the line, when they take control of themselves, you will not. So it's okay, as I say, if they say, oh, all right, or, oh, you never give me anything and walk away, that's not too bad. But when they move to something that's beyond that, then you have to, uh, you have to move in with a discipline and you have to move in uh, fairly swiftly, if you, if you will. I got to look at my time because I'm, I'm chatting a lot here. Yeah, I know you uh, are. And I just wanted, someone's asking when you're first trying the one, two, three method, do you need to explain what it means um, before you're doing it? And I, I know when we were using the one, two, three method, instead of using the room, we used sitting on the stairs because yeah, these, whatever, wherever your timeout is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because sometimes you send them to their room and there's so much fun stuff to do in their room. It doesn't feel like yes, that's, that's exactly. <laughs> Although that's the, the idea is, is that that's not as important as you've removed them. So they, you know, they have a timeout. That's the, the main thing. So to answer the question, um, if they're very young, even under the age of five, then you should just start implementing it. That's one. They'll get it. They'll get it the first time you do it, that when you count to three, you're going to do something. If they're older, you might say, I went to a workshop and we've been doing too much yelling and too much stuff going on here. So we're going to start now. I'm going to give you a warning of three uh, when you do something. And after that, there's going to be consequences. It's going to be a timeout or there'll be other consequences. Depending on the child, you might tell them what those will be. You might ask them if they're a bit older. So again, giving them a heads up is fair. Uh, and even four and five-year-olds, you might want to explain if you think they can understand that this is what we're going to do. So that the first time uh, you don't say nothing to them, you say that's one. And if I get to three, there's going to be a timeout. But Teresa, would you say I am asking you to stop screaming? And no, then, no, they, they, no, that's exactly the when they do it and you've told them in advance again, if they're okay. older, if they're younger, they'll get it out. Uh, you know, you could say if it's the first time you're doing it, that's one stop screaming, but then that's two, that's three time out because adding that part of you know, again, about what they're doing. They know what they're doing. They know why you're counting to three. So we're actually undoing our own piece by, you know, by talking about it. That's the, that's why you have to think no talking, no emotion. Uh, and maybe the first time, yes, you're going to say for the screaming, but once you, they know what one, two, three is, you don't even explain it. 
just whatever they're doing, wherever they just look at them, you say, that's one. And they'll know exactly what you mean if you follow through. So there's some of the benefits of, of, uh, of counting. Uh, again, energy, more fun, all those kinds of things. Uh, your authority is not negotiable. It's easy for other uh, caretakers to learn so that they can be doing the same thing as you. You tell them, don't talk, just count to three and here's what the thing. You might even explain it to the caregiver in front of your children so that they know they know. Uh, and um, there are alternatives when timeout isn't possible, which becomes a kind of essential. So there are things that your children do. They have one goal in life to get what they want. And so they do uh, six things to manipulate. And you see them there, this badgering, please, 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 please. Temper, trying to use intimidation. They'll threaten, I'm gonna run away. I won't speak to you ever again. They know that that strikes parents emotionally. Uh, you know, Marta, nobody loves me. You never, you like him or her better than me. These are all, you're looking at them on the screen. Please know by research, we understand that kids use these as emotional weapons and they often get their way. That's why they use them. So don't let any of these interfere with your one, two, three discipline. Uh, if they tell you, I'm never going to speak to you again, uh, and they say it in such a rude way after you've said, you know, one for whatever reason, uh, then you might say, that's two. Again, we're not going to be emotionally black veiled here. We're not going to use it for that. So remember these, the badgering, the temper, the threat, the martyrdom, the buttering you up uh, and the physical tactics. I've got a grandson who already is a butter me up or he's a pretty good kid. But whenever he says, grandma, you, you know, that looks so pretty or whatever. I, I, <laughs> I, he's only five, but I'm already on alert. What, what happened? What did you do? <laughs> you know, uh, so we have to know. So a caution, uh, you know, does your child have a favorite testing tactic? Most do. So become aware of it. Uh, and if the answer is yes, it means that they have already been reinforced that that works with you, even if it's unconsciously. So uh, as you see there, either they're, they, you know, they've got their way or it's an effective revenge to make you matter. So it may take you a little longer for them to give that up, but don't, uh, don't give in, uh, it will work. And so uh, earlier I talked about the seven start behavior tactics. So these are tactics, of course, that will uh, reinforce uh, for your child, uh, you know, that um, they really don't probably want to do what you're asking them to do often when it's startup. So we want to be sure that we give positive reinforcement for when they do do it, even if you didn't ask. So if picking up their socks from the floor or something's a problem, one day they do it, make sure you notice it. But even if they only do it because you asked, make sure you give them the reinforcement. Make the request simple. I talked about that. Use the kitchen timer. You've got five minutes to do this. If it's clean their room, clean the family room, whatever it is, they have five minutes to do. Put it on and don't talk again. When the timer goes off, that's one. And if they still don't do it, wait a few seconds, that's two. You don't need to say, Again, we're very bad at repeating. I'm going to give you a good example now quickly because I think it's important for older kids. A lot of times parents will use, I'm going to say computer or TV. I'll just use the TV right now. So your child comes home, the rule in the house is, and you've talked about it and they've agreed the best time to do homework is when they get home from school. And then when school, when that's done, they're free for the night. So everybody agreed to that. If your child says, I'd rather do my homework at seven and have a break at school, you should honor that. Just make sure they do it at seven. So they come in the house, you say, you got any homework? Yeah, I got some. Okay, get to it. And then you'll be done. We'll have dinner. You'll have the night to yourself you realize there is no homework being done. <laughs> so you say to them, normally this is what would happen. You know, I thought you said you had some homework. Get your books out and let's get that homework done. Okay, so they still don't do the homework. We will go back to them. Come on, get your books out, get the homework. That's all wrong according to this. So they know they're supposed to do the homework. It's been an agreed upon thing. So when they come in the house and you say you got some homework, yes, let's get, get at the homework. And then they don't, you simply say that's one. When they don't do it again, you say that's two. When they don't do it, and again, you're not giving them 10 minutes. You're giving them a couple of minutes to get it together. That's three, no TV uh, for half an hour or for tonight. Okay, so think about it. These are not little people. 
you go in and there they are watching TV. This is the true reality at the beginning. It won't take this always. You turn the TV off, they turn it back on. Our natural instinct is to say, you know what? I asked you to do your homework. You didn't do your homework. Now you're getting the TV off. Now you're turning the TV off. No, you turn the TV off the first time. You unplug it the second time. And if you have to, <laughs> you remove it the third time. It's not always gonna be that way, but they have to know you will follow through with whatever the discipline is. And we get caught up in talking and explaining and yelling and all of that instead of one, two, three, there it is, no TV for tonight. You're watching TV, turn it off, no TV for tonight. They turn it back on, you unplug it. So we really have to be willing to follow through uh, and on the list, you'll see the things that, you know, you know, natural consequences, if they spill or they make a mess, make them cheat. Charting works great for little children. Don't be, don't underestimate that it also works well for older children. And counting for brief start behavior is okay. I'll give you five to get started. One, two, three, four, five. That's one. Wait a few minutes. That's two. That's three. Okay, here's the discipline. So uh, we want to encourage it. So a caution again, a natural reinforces to praise. There's sometimes not enough to motivate a kid who really doesn't want to do the task, uh, especially if they hate the job you're asking them to do. Sometimes when kids get older, we give them more jobs. So artificial rewards can be used, you know, uh, and that's not a bad thing. We don't want it to be all the time, but it's okay to have those in there. And you know, what are some of those things? They're reinforcers, trip for ice cream, a small toy, those kinds of things. They're not bad for startup behaviors. They're not good if they're doing annoying behaviors, obnoxious behaviors, because we don't want them to be obnoxious to get something they want. But if we say to them, you know, let's get the room clean, tidied up, or can you make your bed? Uh, and uh, you know that just saying good for you, or I'd really like you to do your bed, it's not a bad thing to say, you know what, you did a great job on making that bed. So as soon as I asked you, let's go get some ice cream, uh, or let's get that done so we can go for ice cream. So reinforcers for those startup behaviors are not a bad thing, uh, although we don't necessarily, you know, want to do that all the time. So when do you talk? This is the big question. So you'll see them there. Uh, discipline uh, is enforced uh it's not a good time to talk to them especially or including when they're older uh we want to wait until the child is not upset about the discipline and you're not upset and sit down when they're older and say how could we have done that better what could you have done so that we didn't get to that situation so we're going to sort of explain uh, if it's new or if it's unusual or it's dangerous, we're going to give them, which is what Dorothy asked if it's the first time. So if it's the first time they've ever, uh, you know, um, I don't know what's a good thing. They've, they've taken, uh, you made a cake and they took a piece of cake and you had the cake for company. All right. That's not a good thing, but to give them a punishment is it. So we want to say, listen, when I make a cake, you need to ask me because it might be for company. So next time there'll be a problem. So the first time it's okay, but when it's really dangerous, sometimes we have to invoke uh, a, a consequence right away. Um, so again, I've already talked about asking your child some thought-provoking questions. We want the frontal cortex to develop. We want them to control themselves and their behaviors. That is what one, two, three does. It gives their brain a chance to say, if they get the three, I'm getting a consequence. And so they learn to regulate themselves. It doesn't mean you'll never have to do one, two, three. You'll probably always have to do it <laughs> till they leave your house. Uh, but, but it means that they will control themselves and you won't get into having to give the consequence. And kids learn good behavior in many different ways. So it's important for you uh, to acknowledge and kind of know that. So the caution, um, it's not reasonable or fair for you to expect your child to behave properly just because you've explained something to them once. So children take a lot of learning. Their minds are not like ours. I want to go back to the picture of the little baby in the adult suit. It's what people say all the time, especially if you have an oldest child with other siblings, we often put more responsibility on them than we should. They are children. And even though you say, watch the kids while I go upstairs and when they don't, they get yelled at, 
that's actually not their fault because their brains don't function that way. That's why we have a law about kids babysitting before the age of 12 or 13, because the others are not capable. So good re behavior requires a lot of practice, just like learning to drive a car, learning any new skill. And so we have to help them practice by ensuring that when they don't behave, we give a consequence. When they do, we give them praise. Uh, before we go into grandma and grandpa says, we say, you're not to do whatever. Uh, I don't want you to ask grandma for money or for presents or for whatever. One time when we were going into my parents' house, I, I asked my, I told my kids, we're just visiting grandma for a few minutes and we're going home for lunch. So do not ask her for candy. She was a big candy person. Uh, and my daughter from the back seat said to me, what if grandma asks us if we want a candy? I said, if grandma asks you, we'll take the candies home. So she was outsmarting me because when we got in there, Hello, hello, everybody said hello to my and then she looked at my mom and she said, we're not allowed to ask you for candy, but if you ask us if we want one, we can take one home. <laughs> so, so kids will always try to outsmart you. So, you know, you didn't learn to drive a car. In the end, our faith is a great supporter of parenting, of mothering, of our children. We put these kinds of practices into place because they work and they help us be good parents. But we pray for ourselves to give us the patience we need, to give us the uh, ability to, to stand strong when we're, we're starting to lose it ourselves. Uh, and we want to make sure that our children understand that we are disciples of God and so are they. And so we work our best to be Christ-like, which means being respectful, being in control, all those kinds of things. So I'm gonna end with a Pope uh, Francis quote, as I promised, because our time is running out. Uh, this is from Amoris Laetitia because we're in the year, Amoris Laetitia family year. Uh, and uh, this is number 259, if anyone uh, wants to look it up. The essential role of parents all is that parents always influence the moral development of their children, for better or for worse. It follows that they should take up this essential role and carry it out consciously, enthusiastically, reasonably, and appropriately. And I firmly believe that that is what the, the one, two, three discipline scenario does. It allows you to discipline. It allows you to be in control without getting into the fights and arguments, which opens your children up to not being angry at you, which opens your children up to more, being more likely to come to you when they have questions, when they have issues. And the older they get, the more we want them to come to us because we don't want them getting their information on the internet. We want them to get it from us who loves them uh, more than anyone else. So I will uh, leave it at that. Uh, and I don't know if there's any questions. Yeah, um, can I share the presentation by email? Well, it's going to be on. Yeah, we're going to we're going to upload it to YouTube. So you'll be able to visit Midday Moms and you can uh, watch it from there. Uh, Teresa, I, I wanted to thank you like so much for your presentation. And I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions and I'll I'll, I'll you know, check the chat as well. Um, you know, I, I had, quote unquote, just the two kids, you know, Monica now is, you know, going to be 26 and Michael soon is going to be 24. And um, there was a mother of 12 that I used to call every once in a while and I'd be like, Louise, <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> yeah. And uh, one thing that she said to me that was really, really helpful is that she said, you really do have to remember that there's a battle and you have to win it. Like you have to have that position of, uh, you know, you have to have that position of authority. And, um, and, and so to me, that was really, really, you know, helpful is, is just being reminded of that, that we can't let our kids kind of, you know, step all over us that, that, yep. that but this is that, that's exactly what this is about it's about taking control without being the ogre without making your kids become afraid of you but letting them know and you know kids want us to be in control they thrive they feel more secure they feel better when they know that when they're out of control someone else is but not in a way that makes them feel afraid but in a way that makes them regain their um my one son, uh, the one that has four, his third is very, she just turned four and she's very much into the whole tantrum crying when she gets her way. And as soon as she starts, they say to her, take a big breath now. 
And that's because she's been so much on the chair, <laughs> timeouts, mm -hmm. the one, two, three, that now they had a talk with her and they said they were going to allow her to take a big breath before they start counting. And I would say 90% of the time it works with her. She takes a big breath. Her mom will say, take another. And then she regains control. So it's, it's that way of, of teaching and disciplining, but in that gentle way that keeps us in control. You're absolutely right. The more we're in control, the better off everything goes for everybody. Yeah. And then um, another mom, um, she was, uh, you know, she didn't have 12 kids. She had, I think four and, um, you know, my, my, my daughter's got a similar personality to mine, like pretty strong. And one thing she said to me too, is that sometimes when we're like, you know, going through a spell with our children where there seems to be a lot of conflict, um, she said, you know, Dorothy, you, you really have to ask yourself that, you know, maybe your daughter has gone through some, maybe something has happened at school um, that usually, you know, children that are, you know, um, angry or frustrated or, you know, that sometimes something has happened and they don't have the maturity, you know, to use. Yep, absolutely. And so instead of you getting angrier and angrier and angrier, you have to be thinking that, well, you need to minister to this child rather than to get angry at it. And, um, you know, so that if you ask, uh, uh, you know, a question, then, well, how was your day? And, and sometimes there's all this pent up emotion. And, and then uh, now, you know, I, I still firmly believe in the one, two, three. And then the, the last thing that I wanted to mention too, uh, before we go to some of the questions here, because a lot of people have questions for you, is that there was a Spanish philosopher, and I, I read his book, and he said that it's so important that if you've had some kind of a fight with your, the, with your children, that there needs to be a healing of the hearts, right? Because I agree, but this again is what this kind of, there, there is no healing of the hearts with one, two, three, okay. because you're not angry, right. you simply count. Mm -hmm. They're in control of their decision to move forward. And especially if you have the advantage of having little children, if you start now, by the time they're older, it's, it's a simple process. And when you look at it as a democracy, you know, you're talking to them as they get older. Okay, so we're moving into a stage now where you're making your own decisions about going out on a Friday evening. We need to talk about what time you have to be home, uh, what the consequences will be if you're not, you can call me. So I'm not disagreeing with you. I think when you do get into it, and sometimes we're not, per when none of us are perfect, uh, we might need to, absolutely. But this is, in a sense, a help to help heal and not have to have that happen. Sure. And so someone here is asking that, you know, if you didn't know this method and you did make some mistakes, have you ever heard of parents apologizing to their children? You know, later yeah. in life? Great question. I, I'm not sure that I would apologize saying I realize I've, <laughs> I've been making mistakes because we make mistakes and we are who we are, but I'm a firm believer in saying to your children, unless they're three or under, maybe four or under saying to them, you know, mommy and daddy have been talking and, and there's too much yelling or upset or whatever you want to say. And we don't like that. And we're, and you can say, we're sorry that that's in our house. So we're going to start something new. And that is, is that we're going to let you be, we're going to tell you the expectation of what we have. And when you don't follow through, we're going to be simply saying one, and that'll mean get yourself under control Two, your second chance to get yourself to do what we're asking or under control. and three, there'll be a timeout or there'll be a consequence. And depending on their age, you might talk about the consequence. So it's not really an apology. It's that we're starting new. And then in the first week, expect pushback. <laughs> because this is new. Hey, hey, we got to, before we got to rev mom and dad up and they yelled and screamed and half the time we got our own way and half the time we did. And by the time we're, you know, all that happened. So, but you stick to it, no talking, no emotion. Uh, and you know, if they're bad in that first week, keep to that. And once you've got them in their room or whatever the consequences, go into your room and scream into your pillow. So they don't know that you had emotion. <laughs> it works. It just, it takes, it's a habit for you and them to develop. So yeah. it, uh, yes. So it's good to talk to them, 
but you don't have to apologize for everything you've ever done. Uh, I don't think any parent goes into parenting trying to do something wrong. We've learned a new method and we really believe it's going to make our family calmer and happier. And here's how it's going to work. Okay. And now someone's has, asking you uh, how this method might work or do you know of any resources with children that have ADHD or, or that have ASD or limited executive. Yeah. Function? Apparently, it still works very well. Uh, the research shows that it does work very well. However, with any child with special needs, but in particular ADHD and those kinds that make it hard for the child themselves to control themselves, you have to be a little more uh, understanding of the explaining, you know, when they've done something wrong, uh, where you might know that a, a child who doesn't have any uh, special needs, you could say to them, that's one, when they're yelling at you, because... Uh, they understand they shouldn't be yelling. If you know that your child gets into this kind of rage, if you will, um, you might need first to use something like my daughter-in-law is using with her daughter. We're going to take a deep breath together now instead of saying one, because one might escalate the situation and you're going to try to first decompress the situation. But it will still work because you are keeping emotion out of it and you are not doing too much talking, which escalates anyone, but especially children who are now trying to process their world with a brain that is more challenging for them to do that. Yeah, and I don't know whether this is a, a good idea or not, but when my young kids, they started, you know, when they were little, have these little temper tantrums, I would, if we were at home, I would pick them up and I would, I would hold them up and make them look at themselves in the mirror. <laughs> And they kind of saw how ridiculous they looked. <laughs> and I would just stand there. <laughs> and then they kept saying, you know, yeah. it, was, uh, it was quite a, it was quite, a, it, 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 you know, like they, they came into their own kind of realizing, okay, you know. Yeah, especially as they get to a certain age. But again, the thing about the one, two, three is if they're going to their room for a timeout, if they trash the room, don't say anything about it, even after they're done leave the room trashed. Eventually, usually they'll pick up or wait a few days. Who cares if their toys and their clothes and everything's all of their mattresses off the bed? Don't clean up for them. Leave it for a few days. And then when they're in a particularly good mood, you say, how about if I help you clean your room? Mm -hmm. So now it's on them, but you're offering to help. So again, that's one where we send them to their room and now we're like, look what you've done. You were up here because you did that. And we're all, you know, don't even don't, because that, remember the beginning, that puts them in control. Okay. They were angry that you put them in their room. They trashed their room and you actually talked about it. So now they're in control. If you're worried that there's breakable things and your child might get that angry before you start, take the breakable things out. Because when you're going to do this, at first, there might be challenges. But if you are consistent with it, if no emotion, no talking becomes the rule of day, if you, the natural consequence of that unclean room is they're living in an unclean room, their mattress is half off their bed, that's the way you're going to sleep tonight. Unless they ask you, can you help me put my mattress back on? Don't even talk about it when you go in their room. Act as though you don't see it. Yeah. You will be amazed at how quickly not reinforcing that bad behavior stops it. There's only one reason to trash the room, to make you mad. Yeah. <laughs> That's the key. Uh, so someone's asking uh, just a last question here. I appreciate your time. That does it make sense to, you know, to, to read the book? Or do you think that we've got everything that we need here or... I would always, uh, it's always good to have the more detail, I'm sure. Uh, if you feel, uh, I've given you the real uh, important pieces of it. Mm -hmm. So I would say that reading the book will give you more detail, more of the research, he'll explain more things. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't need to read the book before you start. You have all the bases that I've given you. And as Dorothy mentioned, I know there was a couple of, she is going to post this talk. So you'll be able to watch it again and kind of stop it to read some of those slides that I had to zip through a little bit. Uh, um, but the basis of it is all there on the slides. I will give you that. Okay. Um, okay. So it is 
309. And I always like to end with a song. I'm so glad we had this time together. <laughs> just to have a laugh or sing a song. Seems we just get started. And before you know it, comes a time we have to say so goodbye. <laughs> now someone's asking for the title of the book. Are you able to put it up again? Just uh, yes, I will. I'll go back uh, to the just a second here. And then someone's asking if this works on babies. Um, I don't um, so, oh, I have, oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. I'll put it back up. Um, baby, it from an early age on, um, slide to hold it on one second. No problem. Oh my goodness. Having technical difficulties here. Uh, uh, babies, it depends on when you say uh, what age baby. Uh, you know, up until 12 months, we do have to begin to say no and distract and those kinds of things. But up until 12 months, we're, this kind of discipline is not, they're not able to control themselves in that way. Between 12 and 18 months, I would, I would say the same thing. This is really more for children to and up. It works best two to 12. Uh, but even again, in those teen years, if you sit down and have a chat, say, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to give you the warning. Let's talk about consequences. Let's talk about rewards because I'd rather reward you. It can work. But under two, uh, from you know 18 months to two, you might give them the warning and not do a lot of talking. Um, but it really works best once their mind can cognitively take in what one, two, three means. Yeah, no, and um, just one last thought too, that uh, uh, I always liked having mentor moms. And I think this is part of the reason I really think, you know, Catholic moms groups are such a powerful tool because, you know, if you've got a mom in the moms group that has kids that are 17, yeah. 18, and yours are two and four, you get these kind of cross-generational tips. And, and one mom, um, you know, said to me, don't forget that your children need you to be their hero. So that means, you know, you got to brush your hair, put on some makeup and be friendly when you go to the grocery store. Um, you know, you need to be a lector at the cathedral so that they see their mother lecturing, right? And so we also want to kind of elevate our status, you know, as queen of the home, um, just by being a good, proficient, well-kept, um, you know, mom that's kind of known in the community and so on and so forth. Because when you're the hero, some kids also will do things out of, you know, admiration too, you know? Um, so uh, anyway, we've got- yep. And one last thing I'd say is, you know, we're, we're not all going to be perfect all the time. So we don't have to say if 24 seven, I missed the, But the more you can do it, and, and the more consistent, the better for everybody. And the most important thing about this, and this is why I like this piece, is that at the end of the day, it's a gentle, but firm discipline, which means when your children grow up, they don't have these deep-seated emotions about when we were angry and yelling and screaming and they felt afraid and belittled or whatever that we don't remember and they don't remember, but the feelings are still there. Uh, the experts are, are really, this family of origin is major. That's a whole other talk, so I won't get into it. But when we don't under appreciate what family of origin, maybe that's another talk, Dorothy. When we don't appreciate what family of origin does, uh, in our adult years, we don't remember it, but it is there and it conjures up. And very often adult, uh, you know, adult to adult relationships in the older years can be compromised or more difficult because of these things when they were little that are welling up and neither of them, neither pe person remembers the moment. So this can really help because it's a different kind of discipline. There's not anger, there's not fear, there's not belittling, there's not arguing, there's not screaming. It's simple, straightforward. You have to do something. This is what's gonna happen if you don't, and we both know it. And so, uh, oh, we got all these tips. I keep on thinking of another one is that, uh, you know, uh, for many, many, many years, every single night before the kids uh, went to sleep, I would bless them with holy water. 
And in the morning before they left the house, um, I would bless them with holy water. Then of course they would ask me if, you know, if they could bless me and then we would giggle because, oh, we're now saints because we were blessed, you know? Uh, and, and so now, even if, you know, my son is going canoeing, um, you know, I'll say, come here, come here, come here. I got to bless you and I'll grab some holy water and, and bless him. So, you know, use the sacramentals too and lost yeah. it, go to confession. And, you know, if, if you kind of lost it with your kids, don't forget to confess that to uh, a confessor. Anyway, thank you, Teresa. I, I really would love to have you back uh, to do the family of origin talk. And if any of you would like to have, you know, Teresa come speak at your parish or come speak at your conference, this is only one of many, many talks that Teresa gives. So um, she did put up her, uh, you know, information. If you need it and you didn't catch it, you can email us at info at Catholic Moms Group and I'll forward the email to Teresa. So on the behalf of all of us here, Teresa, Thank you very, very, very much. And I'd like to thank all of you, every single one of you for joining us today. Um, next week, we have Alan Smith is going to give a reflection on what has Fulton Sheen said about motherhood. So um, please do invite your friends, you know, the way that we moms find out about this is uh, when other people tell them. I want to extend a very warm welcome. Someone is here from Kenya. So Tina, hello from, Ke oh, <laughs> away from Kenya. So we've got Kenya, we've got Hawaii, we've got Nebraska, we've got Mississauga, and we've got Hamilton. So uh, thank you all of us for, for joining us. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Catholic Moms Group. Um, don't forget to like our page. I love my Catholic moms group and please pray about starting a Catholic moms group at your parish. We have all of the tools. We have all of the training and, uh, you know, you can make a big impact at your parish and change the lives of generations. Anyway, love you. See you next week, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you so very you're welcome. Much. Thank you. Nice to see everyone. Well, I didn't really see you, but to know you were out there. Yes, <laughs> to know you're out there. And uh, please, if you have a conference coming up, call Teresa. She's a great speaker and she, she had to go a little faster than she usually does. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, devoted Catholic and uh, we need more of those for sure and uh, you know she's great to work with and I really really you know trust her because like you know so many times you work with people and you kind of go oh but uh, you know Teresa's true blue we'll see you all next week hopefully um, bye Mary Catherine bye Anna Chapetta bye Claude bye Anne Wright <laughs> bye Maureen Bye-bye. We'll see you next week. Okay. Thanks. See you next week. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.